Hello again folks and welcome to another screencast on biomechanics. This time we are going to be looking at angular motion 3 and in this particular screencast we're going to be discussing angular momentum. Now as we discussed in the last two angular motion screencasts we've been looking at the angular motion descriptors. In screencast 1 we looked at these four descriptors on the screen now and in angular motion screencast 2 we discussed the moment of inertia and how that applies to moving bodies. As I just mentioned, this screencast is now going to look at the final angular motion descriptor of angular momentum. It's worth noting that this is quite complicated and so therefore what I would suggest is that you go over this screencast a couple of times as you make your notes just so you try and comprehend and understand it correctly. Alright, so definitions first. Angular momentum is the quantity or the amount of angular motion possessed by a body. So remember a body is an object or a person in this sense. So it's the amount of, of rotation that's going on. And we have a calculation for this. So angular momentum is calculated by the moment of inertia multiplied by angular velocity. Remember moment of inertia how movable the object is or resistant to, to movement. And angular velocity is how fast the body is actually spinning. So you're multiplying them two things to create angular momentum. So let's look at this in a little bit more detail. How do athletes create angular momentum in order to make themselves rotate? Well, as we understand by creating angular motion, you need to apply an eccentric force outside the centre of mass. This will generate angular momentum on a person. The greater the size of the force we can apply outside the centre of mass will be the greater amount or the quantity of angular momentum. So we can generate more angular momentum by pushing a greater force around the outside of the center of mass. So here's an example of what we mean by that and how an athlete might create angular momentum. So if we look at diving, now a diver originally will stand on the edge of the platform straight, but as they go into the dive, they will lean backwards. And the reason they're leaning backwards is to move the center of mass outside of their body. So it becomes at an angle. If the diver then pushes hard into the ground of the platform and then leans back, if we think about Newton's laws of equal and opposite reaction, as they push hard into the ground, there will be an equal and opposite force that pushes straight upwards. Now by the dive, diver then leaning back, it now creates an eccentric force around the diver's toes and therefore enables the diver to spin. The harder that diver pushes into the ground, the more angular momentum will be generated. So the more uh, momentum or movement that can be generated. So that is the way that, that an athlete would create spin around a body or create angular momentum. Things to remember as we're talking about this. So from the last screencast, if the moment of inertia is high, then the spin speed or the angular velocity is going to be low. So think about that diver I've just shown you. He's in a very stretched out position. So his moment of inertia at that point will be quite high. So the spin speed to start with is going to be slow because the MI is high. However, as that diver moves into angular momentum or moves into a spin, they will probably bring their limbs towards their body or change shape. And what that will do is it will make the moment of inertia lower. And that means we can speed up the spin speed that we've gained from angular momentum. So he'll spin faster as he moves his limbs towards his body, which we spoke about in the last screencast. The key thing to remember is once the athlete has created angular momentum, it cannot be changed. So the more force they put into the floor to start with to push off, the more angular momentum they're going to get. But once they are in midair, 
we cannot alter the amount of angular momentum that's being generated. We can just manipulate it in order to spin faster or spin slower. So that is critical to understand. Something that usually confuses students in terms of exam questions is this next concept. And we call this the angular analog of Newton's first law of inertia. Now, before we start, if you ever see a question in relation to this, please do not write the, the quote from Newton's first law of inertia. So don't get them confused. This is to do with rotation. Newton's first law of inertia is solely to do with biomechanic basics. So Newton's first law of inertia in relation to angular analogs, so you're looking at that key phrase, is fairly straightforward to understand because it is Newton's law of inertia, but all you do is add in words to do with rotation or turning to the statement. So you can read this for yourself. So a rotating body will continue to turn around the axis of rotation with constant momentum unless acted upon by an eccentric force or an external torque. In English, to everybody else, that just means a rotating body, so something that is spinning, will remain spinning or in angular motion until another force acts upon it. And that is the angular analogue of Newton's first law of inertia. So until the person moves their arms or you have air resistance or friction acts upon the body, in theory, the object will continue to spin at the same rate and the same speed. How the examiners are going to discuss this with you is they will ask you to explain how sports performers create angular momentum and what they do to manipulate it. And they can ask you across a variety of activities. It could be ice skating, it could be diving, it could be slalom skiing, for example. And they'll ask you to explain the process of how the performer is manipulating angular momentum and conserving it, which we'll come on to in a bit. So this next slide will help you to explain how performers create and use angular momentum. So here we are. So if we were looking at an ice skater and the picture shows the different frames of an ice skater going into an axle spin, which is where they jump in the air and they twist around the transverse, uh, sorry, the longitudinal axis, and then they land. The first thing to do with your picture or your, your mental image of what's going on is split it into three sections. So we have section A, which is before the jump. In other words, the takeoff position. Section B, which is the, the jump itself. And section C, which is the landing position. So we've got before the jump, the actual position or the jump and the landing. So we've split this into three. And you're gonna just talk about each particular section in relation to the concepts that we've been learning about. Before you start answering the question, it's always worth discussing what is the axis of rotation that that performer is spinning around. Now in this sense, the athlete is doing a spin turn in midair, so it's the longitudinal axis. So we'll always make that point first. After that, at each of the pictures, it's important to note what is the distribution of mass from the axis of rotation? And we discussed this in the last screencast. So in picture A, the legs are splayed out, the arms are splayed out, so the distribu distribution of mass is quite far from the axis of rotation. In picture B, the distribution of mass is close to the axis of rotation because she's brought her arms in and crossed her legs. And in picture C, we are then returning back to quite far away from the axis of rotation. Again, in every picture or every point, so A, B and C, you then explain what happens to moment of inertia. And the simple way to do this is to either make the statement that moment of inertia is either high or it is low. That's all you will need to state. 
So at picture A, the moment of inertia is quite high. She's quite resistant to turning because she's spread her arms out, as we stated before. Whereas picture B, she's brought her arms in, across the legs, so the moment of inertia is low. Picture C, the moment of inertia is high again because she needs to land and become stable. The next statement for each of those A, B and C pictures is you also need to explain what happens to angular velocity. And again, this is simply high or low. So in picture A, how fast is she spinning? Well, angular velocity is low because Mi is high in picture A. So remember from last screencast, those two things cross over. A picture B, the moment of inertia is low, which means angular velocity is high. So the spin speed is faster in picture B because she's turning around the axis point. And then in picture C, it then reverses again. The angular velocity is low, slower spin speed, and the moment of inertia is higher. And so you might feel like you're repeating yourself when you write the answers to these style questions in the exam. But this is exactly what the examiner wants. You must discuss before the jump, in the middle of the jump, and after the jump in these key boxes that I've put on this screen. When you finish the end of the question, we need to talk about what we've spoken about today, which is angular momentum. You must explain what happens to angular momentum. And the simple fact is this. Angular momentum is constant. It remains the same throughout all those pictures. Why? because we already know that moment of inertia is multiplied by angular velocity to give you angular momentum. So if Mi is low and angular velocity is high, it would still give you the same answer as if angular velocity was high and Mi was low, or the other way around, sorry, if, if Mi was high and angular velocity was low. The final aspect of this is another tricky aspect because the statement itself sounds confusing. We need to talk about the conservation of angular momentum. What this is about is once a body or a person has created angular momentum, what does the athlete do to conserve that angular momentum, to make that motion work best for them? Okay, so to remind you, once we've created spin on an athlete and they jump in midair, we can't change the amount of spin that is being generated. We can only make it spin faster or slower. So we can't change the amount, the quantity. And that is to do with the angular analog of Newton's first law, which we spoke about earlier on. So we can't change it mid-flight. But what the athlete can do is conserve it so they can speed up or slow down the rotation. So they can maximize rotation time by changing what they do with their body. And that is called the conservation of angular momentum. So if we think about our diver, remember they've leant backwards to change the center of mass point. So they've got a spin point. They've pushed hard into the ground, giving an equal and opposite reaction upwards. And they've therefore jumped into the air. This way they've created angular momentum. So everything I've said there is exactly what I've said earlier on. Now the minute they move into the air to conserve angular momentum, the athlete will bring his arms into his chest and bring his knees into his chest and make a tuck position. And this will make him spin faster. It will conserve the angular momentum that he has generated. So by conserving it, he's making use of it to his advantage and to score more points in the dive by making a fast spin. So in the exam questions, you may be asked about an ice skater. How do they conserve it? Well, they bring their arms in, they manipulate their body to make the spin faster once they jump every minute. Or a, a slalom skier, how do they conserve angular momentum as they go into a turn or they crouch down and bring their arms in and use that angular momentum to turn quickly. And so it's just discussing once they've created angular momentum, how are they manipulating it or using it? So please don't get hung up about that and do go over this screencast again so that you understand that concept.
Okay. Once again, thanks for watching. If you need any more support on biomechanics or any other aspects of OCRPE, please head to the iSpeakPE channel on YouTube, and I'll see you again next time.